Okay, well, I think um, Harry Potter, like Mean Girls, is an example of a modern day text that's embedded quite complicated issues within it in a way that they're effectively disguised and I think that's its its, its strength I and mean, I guess you could argue that it's its weakness as well that it could be more obvious because I think probably a lot of people who've read the Harry Potter books or watched all the films might not have consciously clocked it um, that for example Malfoy's in particular um, I mean the Death Eaters in general I think the Death Eaters in general are clearly referring to kind of the Nazis in Germany and around wartime and the kind of Aryan ideal of pure pure bloodness is directly referring to that and um, the Death Eaters kind of campaign to stamp out the Muggles and, and um, Half-Bloods is a direct reference to that kind of wanting to create a, a pure lineage and I think it's I think it's to her credit actually JK Rowling that um, she's embedded it in the story enough that you can kind of experience the the horror of what it's like to, to really look at that kind of very scary um, totalitarian kind of um, prejudice that is so kind of righteous that it's willing to kill people for for its belief because they're you know they're uh, dirtying up the uh, DNA pool. So I think Malfoy's are a very direct reference. Um, what's it Malf Malfoy and his dad? What's his dad called? Yeah, Lucius and Malfoy are, are very, very Aryan in their look, aren't they? With the sort of blonde, ha blonde hair, blue eyes look. Um, so I think I do think that is. I think that's a very clear, direct reference to that. Why is it so important that that example's been put into a film? Well, you know, there's this classic story about an A-level history student who. Um, got straight A's and did really well and it turned out that this uh, student had never actually heard of the uh, the Holocaust because it had just never been mentioned it wasn't on the syllabus and they'd somehow gone through their whole A-level history without ever having heard of it <coughs> I mean I think history is very political and you know we're not we're not taught in school about Margaret Thatcher we're not really taught anything about recent history and the way that a lot of history is framed is around uh, wars and kind of international politics which is a little bit abstract in a way and it seems to be a lot about dates and remembering names and dates I mean, maybe I'm speaking out of turn because I don't, I don't know really how history is taught in school but I do know that most of my students your age don't really know much about Margaret Thatcher and even though she was kind of in for 17 years and formed a very big part of our country and what it's like now, I think that's really scary when there's a hole in people's understanding of the bigger picture. So it's the same with the, you know, it's same with the Nazis in Germany or the communists in Russia. Or I mean, it's not really about the Nazis. It's about any any kind of totalitarian opinion that becomes so kind of self-righteous that it's willing to stamp people out in the pursuit of what it wants. I think it's quite hard for us to imagine that in the West, in our comfortable lifestyles, that that could ever happen to us. I, I think that's really difficult for us to imagine. And I think where J.K. Rowling succeeded is that she's enabled people to imagine something truly horrific that they probably have never experienced in their everyday life, albeit in a fantasy manner, I think that sort of plants the seeds for people to maybe... I mean, who knows? Who knows whether reading Harry Potter and watching all the films makes somebody less prone to prejudice or bullying or, you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, who knows? That's a very difficult thing to say. 
but I certainly think it can't do any harm to drop that kind of stuff into people's consciousnesses and doing it in a popular cultural form that's entertaining that the whole family can see in particular. I think that's uh, Harry Potter's greatest strength is mum, dad, teenagers, kids can all sit down and watch the same thing and chat about it. I think that's really, really rare. So I think that's... Um, I can't do any harm in the world. Regarding prejudice, why was it so important that Dumbledore's sexuality was not to be revealed until after the original fight? Well, regarding prejudice, the thing is, in our society, in the West, <clears throat> which is all I can really talk about because it's all I know, we we kind of fixate on very simplistic handles of, of, of identity. So, somebody's gay, then they become a gay actor, or they become a gay... Uh, part in the film um, someone is black they become the black person in the film someone is black and gay they become the gay black person in the film the fact that they might be the smartest brain surgeon on the planet or nice to their kids or you know lots of other things that could be going on for them as a character in in real life or f or in fictitious worlds kind of gets overshadowed by very simplistic things i mean i think a lot of our tv film industry is obsessed with sex and sexiness so if you're a pretty girly then you get the pretty girly parts if you're a hunky bloke you get the hunky bloke parts and then that kind of overshadows everything else so i think it was an incredibly smart thing to do and i think again this is one of jk rowling's great successes as a writer she clearly had an overview and a big picture plan and left little Hansel and Gretel seed trails around the place but there's so much going on that you forget that they're there and then you find something out later and then when you look back it's like all oh, right yeah that makes sense now but I, I think that's a really wonderful way to do it I think if Dumbledore had been the gay headmaster from book one it had just been a distraction because why why is it significant and um there's a, there's only kind of one inference to um another wizard that he was very close to that kind of when you look back on it you sort of think all oh, right maybe they were a, a couple rather than just mates but it's like so what and i think that's i think that's um I think that's how it should be, you know, right? So he was gay, all right, so what? What difference does that make? I think that's a cleverer way to do it than if making a big deal out of it. Then in comparison with Mean Girls, which draws quite heavily on stereotypes at, at high school, um, do you think it's important that stereotypes are used in film to educate people? Well, the thing about stereotypes and, you know, the comparison with Mean Girls and Harry Potter, the thing about stereotypes is it's a very broad brush way of painting a character. Uh, what Mean Girls is particularly brilliant at is, is creating these little pools and tribes of, like, um, the cool ones, the pretty ones, the nerdy ones. I can't remember all the different... So there's about five six seven eight types isn't there of of kind of little mini gangs and um now it, you know it, is it the case in real life that the nerdy lad with specs who's good at science and maths and probably hasn't had a girlfriend at 16 is it the case that they're always going to be rubbish at football well maybe it is but not necessarily because that is a stereotype isn't it that a certain kind of character that seems to be a certain way, a whole bunch of other stuff is stuck to them. That's what a stereotype is. It's a, it's a cliche. It's a generalisation. But I would say that a cliche is always a cliche because there's quite a lot of truth in it. That's why it becomes a cliche. The good thing about stereotypes, there's a lot of negative things about stereotypes, but the good thing about them is if you throw somebody 
a type that they recognise. They don't really question it. It just kind of goes into the mix of like, oh yeah, they're the the punky goth, sulky emo one shoegazer, or yeah, they're the pretty bitchy girl. Or I think that's it's a strategic thing that sh she did in the in the book that the film's based on. Um, that allows you to mo to move like chess pieces around in a game. It allows you to move things around in the film plot that takes the audience w with it and allows you to kind of embed other things underneath it that if you... It's like the, the, other, the other extreme is like drugs or sex education, which most of the time, in my experience, is very clumsy. And so when you try and make a big deal out of something like, all drugs are bad, don't do them, then it just becomes boring and a, a moral lecture. And there's no bigger turn off than somebody waving a finger at you, telling you what to do or what not to do. And I think that is really the success of Mean Girls and Harry Potter is it just drops nice little things into the mix for your subconscious to just kind of go, right, OK, that's not a very nice way to behave. And who knows, maybe later on somebody who might have bullied someone doesn't or might have judged someone by their colour or their sexuality doesn't. I mean, who knows? That's That's a difficult thing to prove, but I certainly think it's a it's a good attempt to do something like that and i think it's got a lot of value in our society if popular culture can but then the, you know the question is but well, who decides what's good and what's not and what's worthwhile and what's not i mean i can say that i think that's a good idea but that's because i'm a sort of punky hippie liberal you know somebody some conservative kind of hard line i might say that's just ridiculous. What they all need is a good slap round the head. So, saying that, you think that because Mean Girls isn't fantasy and it does use the stereotypes, that it is more direct with its with its intentions. Well, I think it, I think Mean Girls compared to Harry Potter is more. Well, it's more realistic because Harry Potter obviously is is a is a fantasy, and and the 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 advantage that Harry Potter's got is it is not trying to look real because it's a fantasy, so it can it can do anything. It can it can make up any? I mean, things like the um, what's the what's the the Thestrals that you can only see if you've experienced death. I mean, that's fantastic. What a genius idea because. Anybody who's experienced death or seen a dead person knows that you are you are different afterwards. And to have a creature that you can only see if you've experienced death, oh, that's really clever. But what does that mean? I mean, that's just some kind of fantasy idea. I think what's the strength that Mean Girls has got is that anybody who's been to high school knows there's the cool kids and the nerdy kids and the anonymous ones that nobody notices, and they know which category they fitted into and that's like an easily recognisable real life map that you can put a story into that yeah makes sense doesn't it okay, so some of the Harry Potter films start off at I think they were 12 12A and then by the last one they've gone up to a 15 um, do you think censorship is if, if a film is trying to teach someone something um, should censorship matter or should it be implemented yeah it's a tricky one that isn't it around um, age boundaries for films <coughs> I mean <coughs> excuse me I think what I would compare Harry Potter to more than Mean Girls is Doctor Who I think Doctor Who has got a lot of similar issues that is that are embedded into plot lines and Doctor Who and Harry Potter are both primarily for for kids they're meant to be kids programming but I would say we have lost track a little bit in recent times of what kids programming means so I certainly think from the fifth Harry Potter film onwards that you're into territories that, you know, the thing is now anybody can get hold of anything. So you stick 15 on a film, 
that might mean that 12 year olds might not get into the cinema to watch it but it's not going to stop them watching it they're going to end up watching it at some point anyway um but i mean it's the same kind of argument that the porn lads are doing it's like if something's made for 18 plus adults to watch and then it's watched by a seven eight year old lad then you can't really blame the content for doing something that's not meant to do because it wasn't meant to be for that person with harry potter i think that the, from the fifth film onwards it certainly is a 15. i thought the same with lord of the rings i think they're really scary and um you know i mean you wouldn't have to up up it very much for it to feel like a proper horror film in in some parts it's really scary and i think it kind of depends on what kind of scary it is when it's scary monsters you know big spiders or whatever but well, funnily enough i mean the you know the big spiders one is is in the kind of kiddie end of things and i think that's one of the most scary ones out of everything that goes on i mean a lot of people are scared of spiders i mean the woods with the giant spiders in is ter terrifying that scene i mean that's got a 12 certificate on it but then by the, t the but i just think it gets a lot darker and more psychological and you know the voldemort character kind of comes more to the front towards the end i don't really know i don't really know what i think about that i think these days pretty much anything you make is watchable by anybody so i don't think the traditional certificate certification of films means what it used to do when you know when i was a lad if something had an x certificate on it it was really difficult to get hold of it you know you had to somebody had to nick it off their dad's video shelf and smuggle it somewhere and watch it and like that you know and you certainly couldn't have got into a, a cinema to watch it so you know a lot of these issues that you're looking at are issues that traditionally were the domain of schools and parents and now we're kind of having to accept that our education system doesn't really know how to put issues like that across and parents probably with their kids now i'd say have got as big a generation gap as any other generation before if not more certainly around technology i think the generation gap between uh well probably between my me as a parent and my daughter is probably a bit bigger than the last sort of 50 years in a way i mean i kind of know technology because i'm a media lecturer but i think a lot of a lot of parents who are my age look at what their kids are doing and they just have no idea what they're doing with any of the technology that you know they have to get their kids to teach them it so everything's a little bit upside down to the way that it's been before and i i just think it's what you call it's what i would call medicine media there's your sound bite M medicine is anything that is try to do something useful or good in the world and i think harry potter and mean girls are, are medicine media they're embedding a useful liberalist morality into popular culture in a way that i personally think can't do any harm Well, my, da my daughter Becky and I were into Harry Potter simultaneously from the first book. We had, we had to buy every book, we had to buy two copies of every book every time it came out because we couldn't wait for the other one to read it, to read it. So, I mean, my daughter's not really read very much <laughs> in her life. And to be honest, I'm not a massive reader either, but every time the book came out with, you know, two copies, that would be it, We're off to our bedrooms come back down to kind of go right what page are you on then and and i've had camping holidays and festivals where you know everybody's got different books and we're all reading at different stages and uh, i really loved the the thing and that sort of unspoken pact amongst harry potter readers that you, you would never tell somebody else reading it what had happened you just wouldn't 
I don't know anybody who's ever said to somebody, well, I, I guess what happens next and, t and spoils it for them. I, I think that's something quite educational in itself these days. I think it's in an age where you can think of a tune and have it downloaded on your computer five minutes later and people expect everything instantly, in my experience, your generation are used to having everything instantly for nothing. I think there's something quite good about having to queue up and get a book and then have to read it in, in real time before you can talk about it to somebody else. I, I like that. It's kind of old school in a good way. One of the creators of Harry Potter, when I went up to the studios, spoke about he, he, how successful he felt when the audience got emotional over Dobby's death. Um, why are creatures beyond apart from humans, so important into Well, Dobby as a character is, sl it's, it, it, you know, okay, Dobby is a house servant slash slave. So we're into slavery as an issue. And when you're into slavery as an issue, I mean, that's a whole other ball game, isn't it? I mean, we've, we've forgotten in our history Personally, I think in this country, we, we're very um, xenophobic as a nation. We, 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 we kind of, we're not very welcoming to people from other countries into our country. And we have all, a lot of sort of nationalist issues around nicking our jobs and they need to learn our culture and blah, 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 blah seemingly forgetting the fact that only 150 years before we galloped around the planet taking over countries because we felt like it and bringing back loads of people as slaves to serve our every whim i mean we're one of the worst countries in the world culturally for the damage that we did with the slave trade and i and i think it's another good reminder in that sort of sub subliminal subconscious way with dobby as a character to see that kind of relationship between a character that just wants to serve selflessly and um, I don't think most people in today's age probably have an experience of anything like that it's kind of the closest you might have to it is your pet dying or something like that so I mean Dobby is a character when Dobby dies I mean it he's been instrumental in moving things along in a good way and served purpose and it's sad you know it's a sad it's a sad character death in the plot line but i think slavery along with fascism uh and you know and totalitarianism are things in our collective history that deserve kind of reminding us of in a subtle way like that it's powerful, isn't it? Does actors' behaviour, such as Lindsay Lohan in Mean Girls and the actor that, um, that grew drugs, does that have an effect on the message of the narrative? What do you mean, the actors in real life? Yes, yeah, like Lindsay Lohan's obviously been in <coughs> quite a lot. Oh, I don't know, that's complicated, because if you start saying... <sighs> it becomes like, if she's teaching people not to bully, not to do all sort of stuff, and then she, in, in her real life, she's doing that. Yeah, but she isn't... That's, that's, that's a little bit of a, a cross line for me, that. Lindsay Lohan is an actress. She plays a part in a film. She gets hired to play a part in a film that the director and the filmmakers have got a, a sense of that having a, a purpose. Does that mean that that actor has to have that same purpose? And if they turn out to be a bully in real life or they turn out to be a trash head, party girl, whatever, in real life, is, I don't really think that's got anything to do with the film. I, I think that's impossible to expect that characters in films are played by people 
who are con the word is congruent if if you are it's like method acting right method acting dustin hoffman is a kind of well-known method actor if he's playing a crack addict junkie he goes and hangs out with junkie crack addicts and kind of gets into the whole thing of what it's really like to be them to play that part but most actors aren't method actors most actors are playing a part of some that's not them so why why would what they do in real life have any bearing on what the character does i mean i'd take it further than that actually and i'd say look you know we've created a ridiculous state of affairs in our society where we you know this is my usual rant footballers models pop stars actors why do we expect them to be role models why do we expect those people to be an example of what we should or shouldn't be doing in life that's ridiculous somebody can kick a football around punts around on a catwalk or effectively lie and be something that they're not as a profession why would they be a benchmark of anything that we should look to in life that's not the same as the writer or the writer's intentions or the director's intentions is it Well, I think it's. An, I think you're doing an interesting project here, and I think it's very difficult to measure the effect that the you know if if somebody sits there and they they write something, a book that gets turned into a film, that turned into a screenplay, the writer's intentions for that to whatever do good in the world. I don't know whether it's possible to ever measure that outcome. Um, but if popularity is anything to judge things by, which I guess is something to judge things by, then Mean Girls and Harry Potter and Doctor Who, which is my other example, are very good examples of popular cultural forms that introduce morality in quite complex issues in a way that don't feel like somebody's wagging a finger at you and telling you what to do or not to do in your life. And I think that's a good thing.